Cheer up, ladies. Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. It's a big loss to the world right there. Uh, kind of scary looking. Uh, all right. What we're going to do here is just kind of make a very quick run through what is known as the progressive era, kind of some of the major achievements and concerns of the progressive era, you know, stuff that these people were wanting to make progress on. You know, that's why we call it the progressive era. Now, the main thing they focused on was wanting to improve American life. This would be called the public interest. That is the good of the people. In this case, we're talking about the uh, common people. I mean, there were big movements uh, towards stuff like, you know, trying to get tariffs lowered so that American businesses would have to compete with one another. That way you get better products at cheaper rates. Uh, President Cleveland and Wilson both uh, were champions of this. So in this case public interest, we're talking about an era of American history here. You can see all these little boys working in coal mines and stuff instead of going to school, you know, working 10, 11, 12 hour days, not getting an education at all barely getting any money for their work. Of course, very unhealthy work environment, very dangerous as you can imagine. So they're pushing very hard to improve public interest. And there were several amendments that came out of the Progressive Era. One of them was the 16th Amendment. This one's kind of everyone's favorite. This was the one that got it to where the federal government could force you to pay an income tax. This is by law. If you don't, you know, you can go to prison. Now, we'd use this during the Civil War. Some people sued and said, hey, our money's our property. You know, the Bill of Rights protects against that. The case was not heard until after the war was over and the income tax was repealed. And the Supreme Court said, you're right. Uh, your money is your property. The government cannot take it away from you. So the only way you could get that would be through a constitutional amendment. And they, of course, managed to pull this off. So now the federal government has a lot more money. Of course, we all know the end result of that is uh, the government's going to take more and more money over time. Now, of course, that's a fight, you know, a political fight argument, you know, what the income tax rate should be. But as a general rule, the more you make, the more you're supposed to pay. It's kind of a progressive income tax, but not always. There's ways around everything, as you know. 1914, uh, the Federal Trade Commission comes in. Now, this is, of course, to regulate businesses and investigate unfair trade practices. Because uh, you, know, you had these big, massive trusts and monopolies and corporations, and Teddy Roosevelt is going to try to find a way around uh, you know, ruining the economy by destroying these things. So they come up with something called the Gentleman's Agreement. Uh, this kind of allowed them to regulate themselves without breaking them up and then if they weren't doing a good enough job the government would have the power to kind of come in and uh, fix things as they see fit and of course this is another debate that still goes on to this day how much should this stuff be regulated again it's going to come down to politics on where people stand most of the time but this was called the gentleman's agreement basically because you know gentlemen are supposed to come to an agreement that way the government doesn't have to get involved. Everyone should benefit if everyone behaves properly, but of course that doesn't always happen. Now, the main thing you need to know about the progressive era is this advancements that are made in the labor force. Uh, they were fighting for things like workers compensation, you know, before the progressive era, you're sitting there working with those machines. I mean, some of these machines, you know, they could you know, rip your arm right off. These things weren't ventilated. They weren't well lit. Very dangerous. Uh, they like to keep the machines running all the time. So they would actually hire small boys to climb inside them and work on them while the machine was still operating because they didn't want to shut down for anything. You're just running through shift after shift after shift. And if you actually got injured on the job, you know, they could fire you. You got nothing out of it. So one of the things the labor movement wanted was these uh, workers' compensation laws. In other words, if you get injured on the job, uh, you're due some money from your employer. Uh, because prior to this, I mean, you cut your finger off, uh, they could just fire you and hire someone that had all, you know, ten phalanges. 
So workers' compensation, money to workers who get injured on the job, uh, child labor laws. You know, they wanted kids not working in industrial factories because it's very dangerous. And believe it or not, the progressive mindset in this era was kids shouldn't have to work more than 10 hours a day. Of course, child labor laws have come a long way since then, but uh, child labor was a big part of the progressive era, not only for the benefit of the kids, but for the workers. I mean, if you could hire two kids and pay them um, half what you would pay an adult, you could get twice the labor for half the pay, basically. So you get kids out of the industrial plants, uh, more adults could come in and work. Plus the kids could get an education. And you see this picture here, you know, these kids saying, we want to go to school. A lot of kids, whenever they see this picture, like, oh man, that'd be so cool not having to go to school. Uh, no. Uh, working in a dangerous factory, working 12, 14 hours a day, not getting any education at all, not learning to read, write, think. You know, you're basically at the mercy of these employers for your entire life. You know, education equals independence. Remember that, kids. All right. There's this little packet of information you need to know that's basically collectively called the Oregon system. That's because the state of Oregon pushed through a lot of these things before anyone else did. These were policies to try and get more power to the people, the common man. And one of them is called the initiative. Now this allowed citizens to place an issue on a state ballot. In other words, if the state legislature, the governor wouldn't do anything about it, you get enough signatures the people can seize the initiative. That's where the phrase comes from. The voters seize the initiative and literally get the issue put on the ballot. Because a lot of these things, politicians don't want to go out there and put their uh, neck on the line, so to speak, by supporting something. So a lot of times politicians can do this as well. So you'll see stuff put on the ballot. You know, Obviously, we've got very different issues in today's world, but stuff like the marijuana laws, uh, you know, Politicians aren't going to say, yeah, let's legalize it, or no, I'm 100% against it because you never know what the people's reaction is going to be. Here, you just let the voters decide. They get it put on the ballot, and whatever percentage you need for it to pass, if it passes, it passes and becomes law. Another one is called a referendum. This is where voters can accept or reject a measure that's enacted by a state legislature. So, in other words, the legislature can decide, hey, let's put this up for a vote, or maybe they pass a law that the people don't like. You can get enough signatures on there, get it on the ballot, and if the voters say, we don't want it, it doesn't happen. So in other words, in this case, they refer to the voters. Uh, recall. This is where voters can actually remove an unsatisfactory elected official. So someone gets in there, let's say they're serving a two or four year term, they do something really stupid or the people don't like them, they can actually get enough signatures, get it put on the ballot, and the voters have a chance to go in there and recall that politician. Uh, my favorite example I always use here in class is, I don't want to name the state, but I think it was Connecticut, but it was one of those New England states. There was actually a city council member that got elected. and. Not long after, I guess he was celebrating, went out to this club that was a two-tier club, and he was up on the top floor, just completely wasted, and started urinating on the people down below. Now, that's, of course, an offense. You can get arrested for it, but it doesn't mean you're no longer on the city council, uh, you know, especially if you don't get you know, sent away to prison. But the people of the city probably don't want one of their city council members being a public urinator on people. I don't even know if that has a term for it, but you know they can get it on the ballot, recalling. So these are three very nifty little things that uh, they got through. Uh, that's why it's called the Oregon system. Another thing they managed to get through is the direct primary. Now a lot of this stuff happened at the same time, and people are really divided on this. You know, I found this little a picture here that says 1913, worst year ever. A lot of stuff happened, and this was part of the progressive era. So you can see this person here who made this obviously wasn't a big fan of the Federal Reserve that was set up to uh, basically regulate the country's money supply. 
uh, the 16th Amendment that brought in the income tax. The 17th Amendment called for the direct election of senators. Now their thinking here was, hey, you know, prior to this, senators were appointed by the state legislature, so the people didn't get to pick them. So they thought, hey, power to the people, let's allow the people to elect their senators. Now the downside of this is the president was supposed to represent the federal government inside the United States government. The senators were supposed to represent the states and their interests, and Congress, the House of Representatives, was supposed to represent the people. So basically when this happened and the people got to choose their senators, now the senators are beholden to the people as well. They're not necessarily going to look out for the best interests of their states. They're worried about getting reelected just like the people in the House of Representatives are. So this has a good side in that the people get to pick. It also has a downside in that since this happened, the states have lost an awful lot of rights and power. And of course, you'll see here this person didn't like Woodrow Wilson getting inaugurated either because he was, you know, in essence, kind of a progressive president. Okay, the suffragists. These are very important. Uh, these are the women who wanted women to have the right to vote. Suffrage is the right to vote. Make sure you know that. So I can remember a few years ago, one of those late night talk show hosts went around, you know, had a little clipboard and he said, oh, we're taking a poll. And went up to women and asked them, hey, do you want to end women's suffrage? Over 90% of them said yes, because they heard the word suffrage. They thought suffering. Do you want to end women's suffering? No. Suffrage is the right to vote. This was a long, hard fight to get women to actually have the right to vote. And, of course, the movement's three champions. It's going to start with Lucretia Mott. She is kind of going to mentor Susan B. and, or excuse me, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's going to kind of, you know, mentor Susan B. Anthony. So they kind of go in that order. Now, Mott works with Stanton. Uh, Stanton works with Anthony. Anthony, Alice Paul, some of these others eventually are going to get women the right to vote, but this was a long journey, very long journey. And Susan B. Anthony is, of course, the one that kind of everyone knows, but this took several generations to actually get pushed through. And it's finally going to come through with the 19th Amendment in 1920. So you go back to Lecre it's the this women's suffragist movement basically started kind of with the abolitionist movement. Uh, the women's rights activists, they kind of championed abolishing slavery. Guys like Frederick Douglass who wanted to abolish slavery also championed the women's rights movement. You can see it took the Civil War to end slavery, get the black man the right to vote. But think about this. You know, the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote. We're talking 1860s. Uh, women did not get the right to vote till 1920. Now this here is Margaret Newberg. I kind of love this picture because she, she, she looks really, really, really young to be voting, but it's kind of hard to say. She was the first woman to actually vote in a federal election according to the photograph. So women finally get the right to vote in 1920. I want you to really think about that. Women have not even had the right to vote in the United States of America for a hundred years. That's of course in federal elections. A lot of western states like Montana gave women the right to vote in state elections way earlier than that. But you're kind of see, seeing these amendments all brought about tremendous change, either in government power or liberties for people, freedom, stuff like that. Uh, Alice Paul, she was a Quaker and a suffragist. Uh, you can see she had her own radio show. Very outspoken person. She actually left the mainstream women's rights movement and started her own, the National Women's Party, because she was a little more outspoken. They would have called her radical. But here's the thing. People may not listen to the National Association for Women's Rights, you know, like now in the NAWSA, because uh, you know, they'll be the radicals. But then a group like Alice Paul will come along and her group, and they're even more outspoken. That makes the mainstream group look more mainstream. Now you see this with the civil rights movement. People didn't want to work with Martin Luther King Jr. Well, Malcolm X comes along. Malcolm X is so radical, makes people think, wow, Martin Luther King Jr., he's, 
he's way more peaceful. We'll talk with him. So that's kind of the role Alice Paul plays with the National Women's Party. Uh, she probably does not get enough recognition and credit uh, for the things that she did, but uh, you definitely need to know who she was. Now, another thing the women's rights movement wanted was the temperance movement. Now, temperance is kind of a weird word because you see it and you think temper, but kind of associate it like with a violent drunk. Someone who's a normal guy, he gets drunk and he rawr, gets angry, starts trying to get into fights all the time. Uh, not necessarily that's where the word came from, but the temperance movement was just a movement to ban alcohol. This started like in the 1830s. Uh, with women's Christian movements. They were trying to get alcohol banned because back then, you know, alcohol was about all there was. They associated a lot of society's problems with men drinking. You know, drinking, spending all your money, getting drunk, you know, abusing your wife or kids or not fulfilling your responsibilities because you're drunk all the time. So this thing takes about 90 years to actually run through to where they actually get it passed. Now the interesting thing is, of course, the 18th Amendment banned alcohol. That was before the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. So you actually got alcohol banned before women got the right to vote. So that's kind of how this movement uh, kind of really got it rolling. You know, and it pushes through and they're like, hey, we're going to... Uh, ban it on a federal letter level. Now a lot of states like Kansas had it before it became banned on a federal level but you still had saloons, you know, illegal saloons serving liquor. So this lady here with the axe, her name is Carrie Nation, she actually went around to saloons and walked right in with her axe and started smashing up the barrels that they kept uh, the booze in. Some people called her the joint smasher because she would go on with a Bible in one hand and an axe in the other, and she would literally destroy these barrels of liquor. And of course, later she's going to change her name, her middle name, to A, and the way she spelled Carrie to C A R Y. So she literally became Carrie A Nation, which is kind of clever. You know, rappers will do stuff like that today, but back in the 19th century, it's Carrie A Nation. It was women suffragist and women temperance champions. So the 18th Amendment is going to pass in 1918. It's going to ban alcohol. It's going to cause a lot of problems that we'll get to in later sections, but there was a set date. Booze literally became illegal. You couldn't drink it, couldn't possess it, couldn't distribute it, anything. Now it's going to be repealed by the 21st Amendment much later, you know, after the 1920s when the mobsters, you know, Al Capone and guys like that take it over. So the best way to remember this, the 18th and 21st Amendment, you turn 18, you're legally an adult, you can't buy beer when you're 18. So you're an adult, no beer. How old do you have to be to buy beer? 21. So 18, you can't buy beer. 21, you can. If you can remember that, you can remember those amendments. Alright, another big issue of the progressive movement was the money supply. Now the money at this point in history was backed up by gold. So there actually could only be a certain amount of money circulated because the government had to have it backed up by gold. So the poor farmers and a lot of other people thought, hey, if we can back our money up by silver, the government can stockpile silver and we can actually have more money. Now the interesting thing about this is the people who were wealthy, you think they would like more money? Why sure, they would, but that doesn't mean they want more money in print uh, because if they're the ones with the money and there's less money, in essence the money is actually more valuable. So most of the wealthier people were like, nope, we want to keep the gold standard because they thought it would keep the uh, money stronger. The silver standard they said would make it weaker because silver is not as valuable as gold. So the people who wanted us to print more money, they were known as silverites. So if we put some of the money on silver, there would be more money. Now people like William Jennings Bryan uh, supported this. He's going to run for president a few times and uh, he's not going to win, but he was a very popular, very great speaker. 
and he could give a great speech. And he had this one speech called Across the Gold, which he basically said the poor man or the country is being crucified on a cross of gold. We could be so much better off if we didn't worship gold, basically. Now, the people who wanted to keep the gold standard and the gold standard alone, they become known as the gold bugs. So pretty interesting nicknames here, I will say. Uh, and as I said, William Jennings Bryan's going to make some runs for president. Not going to win, but there's the cross of gold. Uh, this is all part of populism. And populism was a movement of farmers. They basically wanted to pass legislation that would kind of improve their political power because they never felt like their voice was heard in government. You know, it's always the rich, powerful corporations and industries running everything. It's always the rich and powerful that the politicians listen to. So the farmers were like, we want more political power. There's more of us than there are the rich. The government should be listening to us. So they supported things like cooperatives and things like that through populism and the Grange movement. Uh, this was the first national farm association. <clears throat> and they would set up these co-ops. That was their goal. Uh, so kind of think of, you know, if you live in a rural area where there are co-ops, that literally means co-op where people come in and, you know, it's a place they can store their grain and stuff, hold it till you know, the right prices come along to sell it. So the Grange movement, uh, that was just the movement of the national farmers, the poor guys with the plow. You see this piece of propaganda here, we, I feed you all, and it's showing all these other people, you know, Hey, railroad tycoon, hey, politician, hey, military preacher, you know, market owner. We feed everybody. And, you know, it's kind of a good point because, you know, without the farmers, you'd kind of be in trouble. Uh, Tammany Hall, that's a phrase you might need to know. Uh, this was in New York. This is kind of this corrupt Democratic Party machine. Uh, we're basically these, this group of guys managed to control all New York City politics, and this was a very corrupt thing. Uh, thought maybe I had another thing there. Uh, but they, you know, they controlled the New York City political machine for a long time, uh, basically through corruption, you know, bribing judges or intimidating judges, police officers, and things like that. They kind of become the example of political corruption in this area. Now, there were a lot of other things, you know, like the whiskey ring and things like that, but Tammany Hall is just these really rich and powerful guys who bought off everybody or intimidated everybody. You know, city council, uh, you know, they could get their people put on there who would support the things that they wanted. And some of these guys actually end up going to prison because of political corruption. So when stuff like this goes on, you know, the progressives can point to it and say, see what we're talking about, have a really good uh, point. Uh, another thing you probably need to know what it was is the Pendleton Act. Uh, James Garfield got to be president. And the way politics worked back then, and kind of people would argue still does, is these guys would get elected and then the people who supported them, you know, through the spoil system, kind of put their buddies with these cushy government jobs. And one of these guys who supported Garfield didn't get the job he wanted, so he actually shot him and killed him. And, of course, the country freaked out when they heard, oh, this guy wanted a uh, political appointment that he did not get, and he killed the president of the United States. So that uh, led to the Pendleton Act. Now, this reform, and it was actually a job with the civil service, which is like part of, you know, the president gets to appoint a lot of people inside the civil service. And the Pendleton Act said people and government jobs need to be based on merit, not patronage. And that's kind of where you pay off the people who helped you or supported you, who got you elected. And you don't hear a lot about James Garfield Chester Arthur, Grover Cleveland, or Benjamin Harrison. There's one last point I want to make here about these four presidents. The reason you don't hear a lot about them is because there wasn't a lot of stuff going on as far as wars or foreign policy or anything like that. You know, this is kind of a slow era of history, but you'll notice when the government's not focused on international policies or wars or anything like that, the country's going to turn inward. 
and we're going to start changing things inwardly, like improving the lives of the people. Because when you're so distracted as a government on what's going on somewhere else, you're not focused here. Or if you're fighting a war, you're probably losing some freedoms. But in this case, this was an era where the United States wasn't involved in any big major wars or you know foreign crisis or something like that. So we were focused on changing things here. And that's kind of what the progressive era was all about.